Okay, so let's talk about partial pressures in the outside air and then in the alveoli and then eventually in the blood. So, as you learned in the partial pressure lecture, when we, if we're at sea level with a total pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury, the PO2 out here is about 160 and the PCO2 is about 0 0.3 millimeters of mercury. So the question is, what's the air like in here in our alveoli? Because that's the air that's going to exchange gases with our blood. Now it's tempting to look at this and say, well, that's the air I'm breathing in, so that's what should be in there. But you have to keep something in mind. When we breathe air into our lungs, several things are happening. Number one, oxygen is moving from this air to our blood and carbon dioxide is moving from this blood to this air. So from that, you would expect to see a lower oxygen and a higher CO2 in here. There's another issue. Not only is that happening, but when we breathe, we don't exchange all of the air in our lungs. If you remember from looking at spirometry, in a typical tidal breath, you go from about two liters to about two and a half liters of air in your lung. So you breathe in half a liter, but that's mixing with the two liters of air that's already in there. And then when I exhale, I exhale half a liter, but I leave two liters of air still in there. So every time I breathe, I'm really just exchanging a small part of the alveolar air. The more deeply I breathe, the more of it I exchange. But in typical breathing, I'm only exchanging maybe 20% of the air in my alveoli, which means most of the air in there is kind of used air. It's kind of stale. So from all of that, also keep in mind that we have to deal with the dead space, which is of the air we breathe in, only a part of that is even fresh air. That 150 milliliters of dead space is the first stuff that goes to my alveoli. So altogether, that means that this fresh air is only exchanging a part of what's in here in my lungs, which means I would expect a lower PO2 and a higher PCO2 in here. Add in even one more factor, which is that we add a bunch of water vapor to this air that's coming in, that displaces some of the oxygen. So, all together, if I look at air in my alveoli, it generally has a PO2 of more like 100 and a PCO2 of something more like 40. So, this air is lower oxygen and higher carbon dioxide than the air out here. The more deeply I breathe, the more this air starts to look like this. If rather than just taking simple, slow tidal breaths, I hyperventilate. Hyperventilating meaning breathing more than you need to, including deeply. If I hyperventilate, go So I'm exchanging more of, well, there we go, that air. I change these to look more like this. That has a number of interesting effects. Interestingly, the major effect that has on your body is not the extra oxygen bringing this up to 160, but rather dropping this toward 0.3. That actually is a bigger effect, which is an interesting finding, but we'll get to that. So, the short version there is that my alveolar air, under normal circumstances, has a lower oxygen and a higher CO2 than the air outside. And typical person at, tide, at sea level, these are numbers that we're going to work with as the standard for alveolar air. So unless you're told that it's different, or you're told to calculate something differently, you may assume that that's what the air and the alveoli are like if you are breathing normally. All right, so now the question is, what about the blood? So let's erase this and talk about what's in the blood. So I'm going to start here with an alveolus. This is going to be a large diagram, so you may even want to skip ahead slightly to see the final version and then come back. We're going to put our standard alveolar PO2 and PCO2 here. All right, so this is the drawing we're going to use. We've got our alveolus up here. This represents the pulmonary capillaries, the blood vessels that go around the alveoli in the lungs. Then this here is the pulmonary veins. This is the left side of the heart, left atrium and left ventricle. So this then would be the systemic arteries. These are the systemic capillaries where we are exchanging gases with the ECF around the tissues. This then is the systemic veins. The right side of the heart, right atrium, right ventricle. And this then is the pulmonary arteries.
What we're going to do is take a look at how the PO2 and PCO2 of the blood, the blood plasma specifically, changes as we go around the circulatory system. So let's start here. Now, right now, I'm not going to fill in what the PO2 and PCO2 is here. All I'm going to say is that as the blood moves around the alveoli, it exchanges gases with the alveoli until it reaches equilibrium with that air. So assuming that these numbers stay constant, we'll get back to that assumption, and this is now reaching equilibrium with this air, what will the PO2 and PCO2 be by the time we get out of the lungs if we're at equilibrium with this? Think about that for a moment. So as far as I can tell, if we've reached equilibrium, the PO2 and PCO2 in the pulmonary veins should match whatever's in the alveoli. If it's 140 here, if we're at equilibrium, it should be 140 here. So this is now what my blood plasma looks like in terms of dissolved oxygen and dissolved CO2. That's traveling through the pulmonary veins and through the heart. The heart doesn't really do anything to the oxygen and CO2 content of that blood. The heart muscle gets virtually none of its gas, gas exchange directly from the blood in the atrium and the ventricles. Instead, so by the time we get that blood out through the heart into the systemic arteries, really it hasn't changed. This has a PO2 of 100 and a PCO2 of 40. So now we're going to pass through the systemic capillaries. And the question there is, which way is stuff going to go? Is oxygen going to move from blood to tissue or tissue to blood? Now, Knowing how the body works, you're probably saying oxygen will move from blood to tissue because that's the point. But let's make sure we know why. If we look at the ECF of body tissue, the fluid around the cells, those cells are using oxygen as part of their, their aerobic metabolism, which means that they're pulling oxygen from, that, from the fluid around them, which means the oxygen content of that fluid is going to be low, on the low side because they've been using that oxygen. So the PO2 of this body tissue is actually more like 40. Likewise, this tissue has been using carbon dioxide, which means the PCO2 will be a little on the high side. These numbers, PO2 of 40 and a PCO2 of 47, would represent a rough average for body tissues. It's going to be different in different tissues. So, for example, adipose tissue, fat cells, have very low metabolic rates, which means they don't consume much oxygen and they don't produce much CO2. So for them, the amount of oxygen in, their, in the fluid around them would probably be a little higher, and the CO2 lower. In hard-working muscle tissue, that consumes a lot of oxygen, meaning the PO2 in muscle tissue will probably be lower and the PCO2 higher. But this would be a rough average for the body at rest. So here comes my blood. In the capillaries, I have a PO2 of 100, and in the tissues, I have a PO2 of 40, which implies that oxygen will move from the blood plasma into the ECF around the tissues. Hope everything's okay. It looks like my camera just flickered. Likewise, carbon dioxide has a higher PCO2 here in the tissues than in the blood. So I would expect carbon dioxide to move from tissues to blood. So, as oxygen moves in here and CO2 moves out here, this, these numbers are going to change. Now, the question, what is it they're going to be at the end? This one is so easy to answer incorrectly, and it's totally understandable why a person would. I would be tempted to look at this and say, okay, if I'm reaching equilibrium, I'll get somewhere in between them. So a PO2 of 100 and a PCO2 of 40, this will go up, that will go down. Let's see, the difference between them, they should be both at 70. That's the average of those two. That's tempting, but wrong, and here's why. When I deliver oxygen to that tissue, what is the tissue doing with that oxygen? The tissue is doing aerobic metabolism. So as oxygen moves into the tissue, it's getting used up. And if we're doing this right, we're delivering blood to the tissue just fast enough to give it the oxygen it's using. So it's a little bit like saying, if you're sitting at your desk eating one M&M Per minute. So you, let's say you've got a pile of M&Ms on your desk. You've got 40 M&Ms on your desk, and you're eating them at one per second, one M&M per second. Now I come around with my basket of M&Ms. If I come around often enough to deliver you one M&M per second, 
and you're eating one M&M per second, what happens to the size of the pile on your desk? As far as I can tell, it's not going to change. If you have 40, you're eating one per second, and I'm delivering one per second. Your pile stays at 40. On the other hand, my basket, as I'm delivering them to you, might get lower. So if this number isn't changing because we're burning the oxygen just as fast as we get it, but I'm pulling the oxygen from this blood plasma, this is the number that's going to change, and it's going to drop until it reaches equilibrium with this. So by the time my blood gets around this capillary, and it has given oxygen to the tissue until it can't give anymore because it's now at equilibrium with the tissue, the PO2 coming up on this side should match the tissue. PO2 is 40. Again, this is a little like saying if I'm carrying my basket of 100 M&Ms, and you've got a pile of 40, and I deliver them to you at one per second while you're eating one per second, I can keep, and I say, I'll give them to you as long as I have more than you do, just like PO2 moves from high to low, then I'll keep giving them to you, and you keep eating them until I've got 40 left in my basket, and then I say, I don't have any more than you now, I'm going to stop giving them to you, and I leave with my 40 M&Ms. Now, take a look at CO2. As I come around, CO2 is higher here than in, than in the blood, so CO2 will move from tissue to blood, which makes it look like this number should go down, but keep in mind, we're producing CO2 as part of aerobic metabolism. So as I'm taking the CO2 from there, the tissue makes more. So that number is not going to change, which means I will keep getting CO2 until the CO2 of the blood matches that of the tissue, and then I can't take anymore, which means I will match. So the pCO2 coming away from the tissue in my systemic veins should be about what it is in the tissue, about 47 on average. So that's my blood coming away from the tissue. Now that goes back through the heart, right atrium and right ventricle, which don't change it. So my PO2 here is 40. My pCO2 is 47. And now we head around the lungs. Now we get in the lungs. Here I can exchange gases. So my PO2 in the blood is 40. My PO2 out here is 100. Which way is oxygen going to go? Goes from high to low. So oxygen moves from air to blood. And we're going to have a similar issue here. What happens to this number? It should go down, you would think, as oxygen moves from air to blood. But remember, we are breathing. And as I breathe, I keep refreshing this air so that as I bring oxygen out of here and I'm breathing, new oxygen is coming in, which means this number won't change. Similar for CO2. Higher CO2 here than here, so carbon dioxide goes from blood to air, which should make that number go up, except I'm breathing. So as I breathe, this CO2 is expelled and this number stays steady, so this number is going to drop. And so I will reach equilibrium with this air and come away matching it at a PO2 of 100 and a PCO2 of 40. That is our general map for how oxygen and CO2 change in tissue, in between air and blood, between blood and tissue. Now, how that oxygen is carried, how the CO2 is carried, what happens to them in the blood, that's going to come in lecture four of this part. But before we end here, I want us to go through a couple of interesting things here. Number one, what do we expect to have happen if, say, I hold my breath? So if I don't breathe, let's track what's going to happen there. First, actually, try it yourself. First of all, if I hold my breath, number one, what will happen to this air? Second, what will happen to the PO2 and PCO2 in the pulmonary veins and systemic arteries? Third, what will happen to the PO2 and PCO2 of the tissue? So think about that for a moment. Okay. Now, if I hold my breath, that means I am not exchanging this air, which means as this blood comes along and I take oxygen from it and I give CO2, since I'm not breathing anymore, now these numbers do start to change. This number starts to go down. I'm just going to make up some numbers here. And this number starts to go up. Since this blood is reaching equilibrium with that air, that makes these numbers change also. Which means these numbers are different. Now, as I come around the tissues, I don't have as much oxygen to give to those tissues anymore. 
So now my basket of M&Ms, I don't have as many to supply to you at your desk. Even if you're still consuming that one per second, maybe I can only give them to you at one every second and a half. That means that this number could start to go down. This number could start to go up, which means these numbers will be different. Which means these numbers will be different. And now, again, this isn't being exchanged. I'm sucking more oxygen out of it. Which means these change, and you get the idea. As I hold my breath, my alveolar air starts losing oxygen and building up CO2, which means my pulmonary veins and systemic arteries have lower oxygen and higher, higher CO2, which means that my tissue starts to have oxygen deficit and CO2 buildup, which is why you can't hold your breath forever. Now, as you hold your breath, you feel a gradually increasing need to breathe. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about what part of this triggers that need to breathe, and it's probably not what you think. Okay, so another question. Let's go. Let's reset everything to back where it was. And now let's ask. And now let's ask, what happens if I go climb on top of Mount Everest? On top of Mount Everest, overall air pressure is much lower. It's something down more like. 300 millimeters of mercury, I think, it's much, much lower. So these numbers are also going to be significantly lower. I'm just going to make some up. Let's say our PO2 is uh, 50. Our PCO2, prop that actually probably isn't going to be all that much different. It might even be slightly lower, just because there's a lot less air. So I don't know, let's go with 35. So what will the PO2 and PCO2 of my systemic arterial blood be? my pulmonary veins and systemic arteries. Well, assuming it matches the alveoli, it's going to match that, which is going to limit strongly how much, blood, how much oxygen I can deliver to my tissues. That's going to be a problem if I'm on top of Mount Everest for very long. So the things I want you to keep in mind are this. Whatever my alveolar air is, the, assuming I have enough time to reach equilibrium, the blood in my pulmonary veins and systemic arteries will match my alveolar air. And the blood in my systemic veins and pulmonary arteries will match the average PO2 and PCO2 of my tissue. That's if I'm looking at the major veins that are taking blood from the whole body. If I looked at veins coming back from, say, a muscle, that would match whatever the muscles PO2 and PCO2 would be, which O2 would probably be lower, CO2 would probably be higher. Okay, there's a summary of how that works and a little bit about how it's different. In lecture four for the respiratory system, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how oxygen and CO2 are carried in the blood, how hemoglobin works, how we determine the saturation of hemoglobin based on plasma PO2, so they call the hemoglobin oxygen curve, and then a few other things about the respiratory system just to tidy it all up. So I'll see you then.